Friendship United Methodist Church in Damascus. And today we are here to uh, bless the Lord with all our hearts. Amen. 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 Um, today is our communion Sunday, so we just want to remind those that are online um, to, um, I guess, maybe during praise and worship, but not too much, um, or during one of the um, uh, breaks, that you would be able to um, look in your cupboard and get some some bread or crackers or whatever it may be um, in preparation that we may have communion service. And again, we have a few here, so we have our communion cups uh, available to us. And if you have a hard time, I would probably recommend that you start trying to open them now so, <laughs> so it doesn't take you a long time. But again, uh, God is good. We are just so grateful just to be in his presence just one more time. Um, we want to keep the uh, Spencer family in prayer. Um, a lot, oftentimes, they come and worship with, with us in in um, face to face. But they are, as a family, going to. Uh, I believe they're in Six Flags and they're celebrating um, uh, some time together. So um, I, I, I believe, as a church body, especially the friendship where we are made up of a number of families, that it's always um, a good opportunity. Take always take the opportunity that we can. Uh, have some time with family. Um, and also, because it's uh, Communion Sunday, we again, wanted to, if possible, um, try to have dinner with somebody. Uh, part of the communion is the love feast. We want to make sure that um, if, if able, if, if possible, that you could at least have dinner with someone, because again, um, a lot of ministry, a lot of blessings, um, things can happen at the dinner table. Um, you read the uh, Gospels, and it seems like Jesus was always somewhere to eat. Amen. Um, we want to keep in mind that we are now in um, uh, the month of Thanksgiving, um, the month of November, and we are uh, approaching Thanksgiving. Uh, if you look around, uh, 
people are starting to get their Christmas lights so on and so forth. So what we want to do um, uh, as, as a friendship family, we want to make sure that we start trying to prepare on ways that we can bless um, someone during this uh, season, um, um, not just individually, but also collectively um, as a church. So um, hopefully when we have our admin council within the next uh, week or so, we can come to a consensus of some things that we want to do um, to prepare for um, uh, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, Christmas and so forth and the activities that surround it. Uh, just see the brother walk in and uh, reminds me of uh, even being prepared for our crush service. Uh, we want to make sure that we uh, prepare early. Um, it was a blessing last year. I think that was the first time we did it virtually and uh, everything seems like it went really well. So we want to make sure that in that preparation, we start um, taking the opportunity to invite others um, to the services that um, friendship, as well as um, anything that we can do um, in reference to the upcoming holidays. Um, I want to, uh, again, thank everybody for their continued um, support in uh, financially um, um, uh, sewing into uh, the ministry for friendship, as well as your prayers. Um, it, it is indeed a blessing. Uh, Sister Julie has joined us in person, so it's good to uh, finally see her in, in, in person. And it um, looks like uh, Brother Harold is about to go get one of them cups. <laughs> so, uh, again, uh, we are just so grateful to God for um, expanding our this branch and, and bringing um, others with their gifts and talents uh, to bless uh, the beginning of the friendship thing. Um, let's see. Is there anything else? Again, um, from time to time, it seems like uh, more and more we are getting um, people dealing with health issues and, and so forth. Um, just keep people in prayer. Um, again, part of what we want to do here is reach out to people. Um, again, I have the greatest intentions uh, to reach out and call if I see anybody, but it's, uh, it's a communal aspect when we reach out to each and every person. So you don't have to say, well, the pastor didn't call me, nobody's thinking about it. You're thinking about it. Um, that is not the case. I am praying for you, even if I may not reach out to you um, directly. And, and again, if there's something that uh, you have in your heart that you want to um, share, please contact me um, and let me know. We'll schedule some time to talk about whatever is on your heart. Um, and yeah, and, and, and going into reference with that is considering that we are in the um, times of our of the upcoming holidays. This is where times where again people um, are dealing with the loss of loved ones. Um, for a, a friend of my daughter's um, school uh, lost her life uh, last week as a young person. I think she was no older than twenty years old by a freak accident. And I can only imagine how the family is um, feeling, um, especially during these during these times. So again, um, she's on our prayer, prayer list, and we will uh, lift her and her family up. And again, just kind of keep that in mind because usually around the holidays is when um, the loss of loved ones um, hits a lot of us uh, most. Um, that's all. I believe that's all of the announcements I have. Are there any? in person uh, that I may have uh, inadvertently overlooked? Um, are there any online? Amen. Let's see any comments. Uh, so with that said, let us um, open up in prayer. Dear Lord, we are just so grateful just to be in your presence just one more time. But we just thank you for this uh, time of worship where we can come together and in spirit and truth and worship you, Lord, in the way that we are supposed to. Lord, we are thankful for our Sunday school class that set the stage and let us know what it means to worship. Um, Lord, we want to uh, get a jump start. Um, we don't want to get to heaven to learn how to worship, but we want to come ready and prepared um, so that when we um, are in your presence, um, we will be um, ready to go. Again, Lord, we just lift up um, all those who have heart to be here but are able to we pray for those that are um, logging in and all the families that they represent. Lord, we just pray for um, the preached word. Um, 
This has been a difficult series and somewhat uncomfortable at times, but Lord, um, you challenge us and you push us so that we can um, look into um, areas that we may not have uh, encountered and Lord, that you can open our eyes and see new things, um, see where, see places where we need to change our change our hearts, um, change our minds, um, look at one another um, in ways where we may be able to improve ourselves so that your name will receive glory, honor, and praise. Again, Lord, we just thank you, um, and, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, that um, there's nothing here that will distract us from what you have in store for us. So again, Lord, this. The service is yours. Um, we turn it all over to you that your name will receive glory, honor, and praise. And let the people of God say amen. 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 I'm sorry, thank you. Sister Tracy, before uh, you start, I apologize. I'm not following the order of worship. Um, so, so if you weren't paying attention, uh, we were celebrating all of our November birthdays. Um, are there anybody here that's uh, celebrating November birthday? I think Sister Cheryl kind of said it. it may be her birthday. Sister Cheryl, if you mind putting it putting the date in on your, um, in the chat so we'll know what date. Amen, well, uh, there we go, November 26th. So get to, you get to eat well and get to celebrate, amen. So <laughs> we celebrate Sister Cheryl and, and on the, uh, November 26th. Um, she uh, is celebrating, uh, we were, well, we're just, she's celebrating her birthday, we'll leave it at that. Um, so look, again, it looks like Sister Cheryl at this point is the only one who we know has a, a birthday in November. So she, uh, we again want to, oh, I'm not paying attention. Um, keep standing, keep standing there. Oh, on the, the 22nd, uh, Sister, Sister Margaret. Uh, uh, Miss Margaret is also celebrating her birthday on the 26th. Um, so, hey, man, Sister Cheryl, uh, 66 uh, years of blessings. Um, so, again, we just thank God for um, uh, Brother Sansbury, uh, Miss Margaret, and Sister Cheryl that are all celebrating their birthdays. Uh, Brother Keith is on the 22nd. Miss Margaret is on the 26th, along with Sister Cheryl. Hey, amen. I apologize a little. Um, a little out of sorts, but uh, God is still good. Amen. Now let's worship. <laughs> Come on, clap your hands.
of the name of Jesus.
We're gonna take a 15 minute intermission and then we're coming right back, all right? Hey Amen. Uh, <laughs> sorry, today's scripture is coming to, uh, together from the book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. The word of God reads, from there Elisha went up to Bethel. And as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here. Bald, they said. <laughs> Get out of here, bald. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went on to Mount Carmel, Mount Carmel, and from there returned to Samaria. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Amen. If you would only trust me. Giving honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. As always, I am humbled and thankful for another opportunity to be in the house of the Lord just one more time. To proclaim the word of God on this first communion Sunday of November, of November among God's people, whether you are with us in person or somewhere out there in our virtual congregation. Again, our scripture reading is a unique one. 2 Kings 2, verse 23 through 25. Again, I'll read it from the uh, New International Version. And from there, Elisha went up to Bethel as he's walking along the road. Some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, he said. <laughs> Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went to Mount Carmel from there and returned to Samaria. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, we are just so grateful just for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, and the experience that we have received thus far in this worship service. And now, Lord, it's preaching time. We pray, Lord, that you would sit me down and you step up, that the people no longer see me, but see you, and that your word will go out to whoever needs a heart change, a, a mind change, something that will um, put them in a space where now you are the fourth. And Lord, I have nothing to say, but only through the power of the Holy Spirit can your, um, put your message move to your people. So again, Lord, Pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. If I had to use the title for today's sermon, it would be Respect Me Because I'm Not the One. Respect Me Because I'm Not the One. As we continue in our sermon series, exploring unfamiliar paths with a new perspective, today our path takes us to the book of 2 Kings, where we'll explore how God can send a message through an unexpected and unconventional method that we may not understand or even agree with. But, somebody say but, but. even if you disagree with the method, the question we need to ask is, did we get the message? Now, I've read this text several times and meditated on it, listened to it, meditated on it, and then read a few commentaries. And I believe what God has placed in my heart this morning through the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit is that we need to all understand the message that the late great psalmist Aretha Franklin proclaimed in 1967, which was all she wanted was a little R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And if spelling is not your forte, Miss Aretha just wanted a little respect, just a little bit, just a little bit. Now, I know what someone is saying, but what does respect have to do with this text? Well, before we get into our focus text, we need to go back to 1 Kings chapter 19 to understand the context. In 1 Kings 19, we learn about one of the most familiar stories of the Bible as it outlines the aftermath of Elisha the powerful prophet who defeated 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of, um, of Asherah in a spiritual battle royal on Mount Carmel where he supernaturally called down fire from heaven in victory. But shortly after, Elijah ran for his life into the wilderness in response to the threats of Jezebel. And then Elijah's uh, desperation to get away from Jezebel, he eventually makes his way through the wilderness of Mark, uh, uh, makes his way through the wilderness to Mount Horeb, where God spoke to him through a still small voice and gave him his next prophetic assignment, one of which was to name Elisha as his, uh, as his eventual successor as prophet 
of God. And from 1 Kings 19 until 2 Kings uh, 2, Elijah and Elisha were joined at the hip, two peas in a pot, and ride or die servants of God. When we get to 2 Kings 2, verse 1, it says, When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Now, this verse refers uh, to how God was planning to end their prophetic ministry together by supernaturally taking Elijah to heaven in a whirlwind. And in verse 11, the Bible specifically says that as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Now, this supernatural curbside service to heaven is unique because Elijah is identified as one of only two people recorded in the Bible who have never experienced physical death. Now, for all of you Bible, uh, Bible trivia folk, who, 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 who was the other person? I ain't going to give you time to Google that. It, it, it was Enoch. In Genesis 5, 24, it states, Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Amen. Write that down for later. <laughs> now, going back to the text in verse 12, it says, Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. And afterwards, some translations say that, he, that Elisha picked up the cloak or the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Hence the phrase, picking up the mantle, referring to Elisha taking over the responsibilities as God's prophet. Now, after what many scholars believe was a five to six year mentorship between Elijah and Elisha, God takes Elijah home, which had to be an emotional and difficult period for Elisha to experience, uh, considering losing someone who he considered his father in the ministry and now has this overwhelming responsibility to be the successor uh, to one of God's greatest prophets whose ministry spanned for, uh, for multiple decades. And the only thing left um, uh, that, that was a reminder of Elijah is this mantle or cloak, which also represented the transfer of, transfer of prophetic power and authority, which has now been given to him. Now, I don't know if Elijah had time to process the gravity of his new responsibilities. I, I don't know uh, if Elisha had the opportunity to grieve over the loss of his mentor and friend, but what we do know is that Elisha went to work and God's anointing was clearly on him as the Bible speaks of him performing at least two miracles since Elijah went to heaven. One where he parted the Jordan and crossed over, and then when he purified the waters in the city of Jericho. But in verse 23, which is the beginning of our focus text, it tells us that after leaving Jericho, Elisha went up to Bethel. And as he was walking, possibly alone, some boys came out of town to jeer or mock him, saying, get out of here, or in some translations, go up. Get out of here, Baldy. <laughs> now, 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 there was a time when I had a thick head of hair when a juvenile insult of Baldy would not have meant much to me. But today, I believe Many of those who are part of the Follically Challenged Club would take offense to that name, especially from some young punks with no house training. The, 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 the nerve of these young punks calling God's anointed Elisha bald. Now, before we get to Elisha's response, we need to understand that even though some translations refer to the, these boys as small boys or even little children, 
we need to understand that the Hebrew translations for boys is Nahar, which actually covers the age from infancy to adolescence, up to about the age of 20. Now, many theologians believe that these, I'm going to give you the air quotes, kids were not small children, but young adults, or, or more, more than likely teenagers who came out of the city of Bethel to confront and mock Elisha. Now, I believe they were teenagers because oftentimes it's the teenagers that like to test their boundaries when it comes to respecting authority of adults. But all the parents who have raised uh, or are currently raising teenagers, Zoom chat a same man. But what the Bible does not clearly say is if the young people had other motives besides confronting and mocking Elisha outside of the city. The Bible does not clearly say if Elijah was alone, Eli Elisha was alone and felt threatened, nor does the Bible say exactly how many of these children showed up to mock him. But the Bible is clear that their intentions were to discourage him from entering the city of Bethlehem. We don't know if the purpose of the children meeting the prophet outside of the city had other nefarious int intentions, but again, we are clear that they were there to discourage him to leave or go up, which may have been another dig to mock Elijah about how his mentor Elijah had departed from here. Now, I don't know about you, but kids are not always kids. Because we have seen videos and read about reports of kids who unprovokedly target random people to beat them up for fun. We, we hear about gangs of kids robbing people. We have heard about gangs of kids who target people to play the knockout game. Where kids will sucker punch random people just to see if they can literally knock them out with one punch. We hear about kids who target high-end stores to commit mass shoplifting. And, and, and being raised in Philly, I remember times when coming home from school and riding the trains and subways of Philadelphia that there were gangs of, gangs of kids who would target people on the train and assault them. And what made it worse was they were not always just about teenage boys, but they were all also teenage girls who I saw attack others with the same ferocity that the boys did. But because they are just kids who, who purposely go out to cause chaos, nobody ever thinks it's a big deal unless you or your loved ones become the target or until someone seriously gets hurt. Now, regardless of the ages of the kids and their intentions, it was clear that they lacked respect for Elisha. That they knew Elisha was their senior and that he was a prophet, which was, again, the reason for the confrontation. So, so they knowingly traveled as a group of kids for the sole purpose of disrespecting Elisha, the newly appointed prophet of the Most High God. They, they showed up to disrespect the prophet of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the kids. Organize and plan to leave the city to disrespect the prophet of the I am who was mentored under the authority of Elijah, who was renowned for making it rain with fire from heaven. Especially when there was disrespect against God or God's prophet. Now, one of the things about these kids is that I don't think they knew that when they disrespected the prophet, a prophet is one who speaks on behalf of God, meaning when they disrespected Elisha, they were also disrespecting God. Leviticus 19.32 tells us to stand up in the presence of the age and show respect for the elderly and revere your God, I am the Lord. 
Now, if the kids are showing up in masses to disrespect the prophet, what does it say about the parents who are teaching them that it is, it is okay to disrespect your elders and more so God? What does it say about a society when people no longer respect God? Today, the lack of respect for taking the Lord's name in vain is so prevalent in our common language of, that, that, that people don't even realize it is a disrespectful offense to the holy name of God. The days when people uh, uh, had respect for the church are gone as there was once a time when even if you did not go to church, you still respected the church. You, you, you would stop cussing, smoking, or even wait to drink what you had in your little paper bag until you were out of ear or eyesight of the church. But nowadays, people no longer turn their music down when driving past the church. And, and some have no shame that they are willing to smoke and drink on the very steps of the church. And when there is continuous decline in the respect for God, and a better term would be when you lose your reverence but God, don't be surprised when you suffer from the curse of God, and sometimes it may come when you least expect it. The text says that after the second baldy remark, Elisha turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Again, it is important to understand that Elisha actually, uh, well, to understand what Elisha actually said and meant to better understand the text of what just happened. Now, let's be clear, Elisha was clearly annoyed. I would be annoyed. <laughs> but the text says he turned around and looked at them, but, but when the Bible said Elisha cursed them, the Hebrew word used for, 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 for curse is a uh, uh, kolal, which literally means to curse, despise, or to be trifled. Meaning Elisha was angry, but he did not curse them as we understand what it means to curse somebody out. He, he, he did not curse them from the perspective of wishing them some kind of bad ill will or misfortune, Elisha probably looked at them and said, look, after all I have gone through lately, this is not a good day. <laughs> and I'm not the one you want to be messing with. So you all need to take your wet behind the ears, snotty nose, don't know nothing, you know no good, trifling, ignorant heathens who need to be in the house and respect your elders because honestly, you don't know who I am, and who I represent. I'm reminded during my teenage years, there were times I would respond to my mom in a way that was borderline disrespectful. And she would ask me, what did I say, and who was I talking to? Not because she did not hear what I said, but because my response was borderline disrespectful. So she would ask me to repeat myself to clarify what I had said or change the tone or bass in my voice. And I believe Elisha responded to those kids like my mom used to warn me that she was not one of my little friends. And not because I had small friends in stature, but because I needed to understand that my level of respect for her must be significantly greater than how I interacted with my friends. Now, I know people who are not so fortunate to receive a warning rebuke, but receive a rebuke after they woke up. <laughs> Somebody from the old school just said amen. Uh, now, like, brother, Harold, I don't know what I'm talking about. Now, I know that level of correction for some of us who grew up is now unacceptable in our current environment. But there was a time when parents would check disrespect without warning or option of being placed in timeout. 
Now somebody is saying, well, if, 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 if Elisha is saying Elisha had to curse them because the text says that he cursed them in the name of the Lord, which means despite his anger, what he actually did was he took his rebuke and turned it over to the Lord. That's it for you so even if Elisha wanted to curse the kids in a negative way, we must remember that no one has the power to curse anyone. Because only God can curse, which is actually the opposite of a blessing. Meaning, when you are cursed, is a removal of God's blessing, his favor and protection. But just as when you are blessed, you have God's favor, mercy, and grace. Soon after Elisha rebuked, the Bible says that 42 of the young boys were suddenly mauled by two female bears. Was this a coincidence or bad timing? Or did God exact punishment on 42 of the how many ever other kids that were there disrespecting the prophet? Again, 42 was who God, we don't know, it might have been a hundred of them at that period of time. And I know somebody is saying, come on, come on, come on, Pastor Newman, they were just kids. Why couldn't God use another way to reprimand those kids? The, the punishment seems too harsh. And I would say, how do we know if God had not already tried to do this many times over? We often want mercy for others until we are the victims or someone we know and love. What if those kids were disrespecting your husband, your father, son, or uncle? What if someone was disrespecting your wife, mother, or daughter? Would you want some type of retribution? Being a basketball dad, there are times when I'm sitting in the stands and literally pray no one says anything disrespectful about one of my daughters because there might be a problem. <laughs> I'll pray for you. That's why season is coming up. <laughs> and we all should be respectful of each other because you never know when you may roll up on the wrong person on the wrong day. Hebrews 13, 2 tells us, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, or by doing that, some have actually entertained angels without knowing. Being respectful is important because you never know who you may be talking to about at your job who actually may be the undercover boss. The, 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 the person in the car in front of you that you do not recognize and who you just beat your horn at disrespectfully and then followed up with giving them the fever is now also turning into friendships parking lot. Mm -hmm. It happens to be your name. <laughs> Oftentimes, we don't learn from God unless we learn about or, or, or experience a severe consequence for our actions. Throughout the Bible, there are severe and lasting consequences to sinful actions when there was a lack of reverence or respect for God or God's servant. Y'all read the Bible, and Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because they were disobedient to God. Two cities were destroyed simultaneously because of their sin. Moses' sister had to suffer with a brief bout of leprosy when she began to disrespect Moses, and a husband and wife dropped dead hours apart because they lied on their giving statement. A brother was killed because he touched the Ark of the Covenant just to keep it from falling. And there are many other tragic consequences in the Bible in response to a lack of reverence to God or God's servant. And some of us may be asking why, because God is trying to show us how a lack of reverence uh, for God can quickly evolve to disrespect among one another, that like a disease can quickly kill a culture if left unchecked and not dealt with swiftly. See, we forget that when we lose reverence for God, 
It's just a matter of time when we are comfortable disrespecting the persons that are made in the very image of God. In our arrogance, we often take God's grace and mercy for granted. And when we forget that uh, if God would just remove that grace and mercy for a moment, Satan is waiting for an opportunity to pounce the bow and maul us to death, just like the female race. One of the reasons God provided us with the Ten Commandments is for us to understand the necessity of a relationship between our reverence for God and our respect for one another. And when we lose our reverence for God, it's just a matter of time before we no longer again respect one another. If we evaluate our history in the current state of our country, when we lost our reverence for God, slavery became easy to justify. When we lost our reverence for God, it's easy to promote human trafficking. When we lost our reverence for God, murdering someone has become trivial. When we lost our reverence for God, ostracizing someone who speaks a different language now becomes inconsequential. And when we lose our reverence for God, it becomes easier to hate, slander others when our comfort and privileges are compromised because we refuse to sacrifice in order to protect the lives and well-beings of others who, may, who are made in the very image of God. April 2015, there was a mom that received a lot of attention in the news when she was caught on camera, unashamedly disciplining her 16-year-old six, son who appeared to be participating in the rioting in the streets of Baltimore following the death of Freddie Green. Despite all the confusion and chaos, she recognized her son in the sea of people, despite her son wearing a hoodie and a ski mask over his head. And immediately with no shame, she proceeded to discipline her son in the middle of the street among his peers with a rod of correction, despite not even having a rod. Because she understood that his disrespect for authority could potentially lead to her son facing the ultimate consequence, which is death. And if you saw the video, of her son receiving his well-deserved discipline, he accepted the discipline without resistance because he respected her enough to realize in her words that she did not want to lose her son to the streets. What if there was at least one parent from the city of Bethlehem who would have ventured out of the city to rebuke their son for disrespecting the prophet of God Maybe there would be would have been one less child that was attacked by the babies. Sometimes it is in God's most severe and unexpected messages of rebuke when we are able to learn to give him the greatest reverence. Again, this may not be the type of message where someone runs to get saved, but prayerfully, this is a message to rebuke someone from going to heaven. Amen. We are now at a point in time where we need to understand that giving respect is bigger than just someone treating you as you will want to be treated. When you disrespect somebody, what you're doing is you're looking someone who, again, who's made in the very image of God and saying, I don't regard you as someone who deserves my respect. You're in such, a, uh, such an interesting time where it seems like nobody respects women. Matter of fact, it almost seems that the more people that you disrespect, the more quote unquote likes you get. That is showing us, as we were talking about in, the, uh, in Sunday school, that we are indeed in the last days. Just as um, with some of us who are experiencing the young, um, young lady who passed, 
in my free accident, you could literally be here today and gone today. The question that we need to understand is, if God calls us home, just like he did Elijah, we were snapped up. And again, God doesn't have to send the chariot, but God can just say, today your soul is required. Are we confident that we will be ushered into heaven? And if you are not sure about that, you and I need to have a conversation. Because you should know that you know that you know that if God has called you to call you home today, that you will be with him in eternity. God says if, if you trust in your heart and believe that Jesus uh, died and rose from the, uh, rose from the dead, receive him as your Lord and Savior in that moment you will be saved if you have said that I bless you I can't wait to see amongst us with that as we spoke in Sunday school that number that no one could count many tribes and nations there won't be a black church a white church it will be God's church There, and that, again, go back to Sunday school, there's going to be a party. A party that just don't stop. If that is you, and you felt that God has spoken to you even now, you're saying, I need to be saved. If that is you, I ask that you. Again, it's only four of us right now, five including myself <laughs> in the congregation. But for those that, for those of us, uh, of you that are online, uh, the easy thing to do is just raise your hand in the chat. Virtually give God your heart right now. Again, I always say we do not rush this time because somebody could be making a life or death decision. While someone's making that decision, we're going to ask that you pay on behalf of others. Somebody that you know may not have a relationship with God. And it actually may be somebody in your very house. As we're praying, we're going to ask that again, if somebody who is out there somewhere in the virtual line, or in, in the virtual uh, congregation, they say, I like logging into prison ship. Y'all people are, are good people. Uh, I, I feel a connection. But you have not made the, the decision to officially join us. Again, we love having you here. We're not going to turn you away, but why not pull in the drive, pull, pull in the parking lot, get your wagon uh, to, to, to a church, to someone, to a place that's going to keep you accountable, a, a church that people can pray for you, a church that's going to love on you, a church where you feel that at least you are at home somewhere to rest your head until God calls you us. Again, I always make it sound like I'm not I want to put you in a headlock and say, once you join friendship, you can never leave of the church. That is not my job. My job is that while you're here, I'm going to be your pastor. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to be as available as you allow me to be. If that is you, I ask that you raise your hand wherever you may be. Uh, we already proved and we already proved that it's possible to join the church first. Amen. And lastly, by chance, if we have somebody online that has uh, claimed friendship as their church, but have not officially, um, uh, let, let me rephrase that. They were part of friendship at one period of time, but we haven't seen you in a while. Matter of fact, we, we, we looked on and I said, oh, we ain't seen brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so in a while. It's good to see you. He said, yeah, you know, I never left. <laughs> So Cheryl said we took you off the roll at the last charge conference because we haven't heard from you in over three years. 
If that is you, we're going to ask that you come back. Let's let's reunite. We're not going to say where we've been and whose church you've been at. We're just going to welcome you back because again, we want to be with one another on on one accord. If that is you, we're going to ask that you. Again, we just want to make sure that we do not um, rush this period of time because again, it allows everybody. Have that period of time because oftentimes, and I'm pretty sure one time or another, um, just as Sister Jean said, sometimes yourself or the enemy will get in your ear and say, No, oh, why don't you wait to next week? Oh, no, you don't got to do that. You rebuke the enemy right now in the name of Jesus. God is speaking to you. We're going to ask that you. And I just want to provide the clarity that if, if by chance that you're not ready to say anything now, you can always reach out to me and say, Pastor, I, I wanted to, to, to take the call and so forth, but I didn't feel comfortable. Um, but on this Tuesday afternoon, I'm ready. That's all right. Uh, God does not uh, keep, keep people from joining uh, his body and so forth. Um, on Sunday, on Sunday afternoon at 12.08. <laughs> With that said, we will allow, let us let us pray before we start. Our Father, our God, Lord, we are just thank, so thankful for the message that you provide. We pray, Lord, that we will now have a, a spirit of respect in our hearts for whoever that we can come to. We pray, Lord, that even if we see somebody being disrespectful, that we will have a voice that will alert somebody that, we, that you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't speak that way. You shouldn't behave that way. Let us not be afraid to say things that may make us uh, be considered tough or uncomfortable. Again, Lord, we pray that what we've learned and what we receive now will remain in our hearts that whenever we go forward, wherever we may go next, and as we go to the supermarket, as we go um, back to our households, and we come out of our days and so forth, that, that our, our loved ones, our friends, our family will see that there is something indeed different from us will give us the opportunity to explain that that difference is the Christ that lives in us. Thank you, we honor you, and we praise you. And let the people of God in person as well as virtually say amen. 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 We're now at the point in time where I would have hoped uh, at some point of the service that you were able to get your um, your, your, your bread, your cracker, uh, your uh, grape juice, or pomegranate juice, uh, some juice of the vine, that we now may be able to participate in communion together. And for those in, uh, who are with us in, in, uh, in person, I hope you were able to get to your communion cup. I was uh, disobedient to what I asked myself. It should have uh, Worked on opening mind, but I think I got it. Usually Brother Asher is the master <laughs> opening uh, communion cups. He's not here, so I'm going to have to do it yourself. Amen. We participate in communion as we declare our faith testify to Jesus as the Christ as Lord and Savior. We participate in communion as an act of worship in remembrance of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ as a source of our soul salvation. We participate in communion as an expression of our relationship to Christ and to each other. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
And whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Therefore, let a person examine themselves. Then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and eats and drinks judgment on himself. Meaning, before you participate in communion, take time to examine your heart and understand the importance and purpose of communion so that this act of worship is not taken lightly. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we are just so grateful for this opportunity of communion. Lord, we pray that you would bless uh, the elements, the, the, the bread, the cracker, um, the juice uh, that will be received with thanksgiving as a reminder of what you have done for us such a long time ago. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy towards us. Please bless it and as we receive it. Thoughts will always be reminded at your great sacrifice so that we will be in union with God the Father throughout all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he sat down, the 12 apostles with him, and he said to him, to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. For as often as you eat this bread and drink, this, the drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he So he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. Said, this is the body, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, let us see. In the same way, also, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave. Uh, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So likewise, let us drink. Lord, we are so grateful for this opportunity again. Thank you for this communion as we commune together as one body in Christ. Amen. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So likewise, let us go out to where, where God is calling us to go with a song in our heart, proclaiming to the world, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Amen. Amen. Amen.